Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today, I found ECRI's top 10 list of patient safety items for 2024, and we're gonna go over them together. Cause I really wanna hear you guys' opinion and maybe you'll hear a little bit of mine. So this should be good. So let's get right into it. All right guys, this is on Health Exec website. It was published March 12th, 2024, and it's written by Dave Pearson. And down here at the bottom, we have our top 10 list. So the number one thing that they're talking about is challenges transitioning newly trained clinicians from education into practice. Hmm. Challenges transitioning newly trained clinicians from education into practice. Now, would you be thinking that that means that the schools aren't as good as they used to be, or maybe that they're not given enough time in trials and that they expect them to do it in the field? We do see a lot of students at hospitals nowadays. However, I've been to several nursing schools, and I know that the nursing schools are way better than what they used to be. So in that regards, I think that uh, medical schools are better than what they used to be. So what would cause the challenges of newly trained clinicians to have uh, more complications than what they're used to? I don't know. It's interesting. So number two. Number two, workarounds with barcode medication administration systems. Now, this one here for me is a little ambiguous, and that's why I would like to maybe hear you guys' opinion and see what's going on. Um, workarounds with barcode medication admin systems. Well, I thought that barcode uh, medication systems actually prevented a lot of user errors. And when they're talking about workarounds, now does that mean that they're bypassing it? Or I, I don't know, what do you guys think? What do they really mean by that? Or is it, is it really user error? Are they mislabeling vials? And that's actually, they're relying solely on the barcode instead of actually reading the label? I'm just curious. What do you guys think? But the, yeah, they say workarounds with barcode medication administration systems. That's usually a pharmacy run program. And normally there's local processes in place that kind of limit the amount of user error. I don't know, guys. That's a good one. But uh, I don't know how you would... Uh, other than, you know, fire your staff. I, I don't know how you'd fix that problem. So next one, number three, barriers to access maternal and perinatal care. Hmm. Okay. Well, I myself have gone to medical facilities out in the middle of nowhere, and they have minimal neonate consumables and supplies and limited experience treating neonates and stuff. So it's true. However, large medical systems have put up I'd say over the last 10 years, a lot of mother baby wards and entire buildings specifically <laughs> specifically dedicated to um, baby and mother care. And, and I applaud them greatly because, you know, it, it is a specialty in the medical field and more so it's a, it's a environment where you want the patient and uh, the, I guess you could say the mother's a patient too. <laughs> you want the patients to feel safe and comfortable with Especially trained staff. I mean, you have to be on your ball game when you're dealing with neonates and pediatrics and and mother baby wards. So um, I have definitely seen that though. In in a lot of rural areas, there is limited specialty care for mothers and babies and stuff, and uh, that is definitely a problem. So I guess we'll see how that goes forward. I don't know. If you guys have any ideas, let me know down below. Um, I know that there's many areas in this country that, that are hurting for that level of care. I'm in Houston. You can walk down the street and trip on a hospital that's got excellent mother and baby care. So number four, number four, unintended consequences of technology adoption. Oh God, that's a good one. Like you guys, you guys probably could have predicted that one. See, what it is, is a lot of people that are uninformed, that have little to no experience, are making judgment calls about the medical technology and the direction healthcare facilities are going. And because of that, a lot of these decisions are ill-equipped. Um, they just are not looking towards the future other than for the moment. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of technology decisions are based on dollar signs. So although right now they can get a better deal, 
in the long term, it's often a very expensive endeavor. Maybe they don't have the infrastructure. Maybe they don't have the consumables. I mean, there are many unintended consequences um, to technology adoption. And it's always going to happen, though. But here's the good thing, is there are many of us prior biomeds and medical healthcare technology managers that are uh, getting into equipment planning roles, and thus we're giving them much more information relevant to purchases than they've ever had historically. So it's a good thing that biomeds, senior level biomeds are getting into these positions. They're becoming equipment planners, project managers. So that these hospitals make better decisions because the wrong decisions are very costly, unfortunately. All right. <laughs> so number five, decline in physical and emotional well-being of healthcare workers. That's a good one. We've known that this has been a problem for a while. They're burning people out left and right. And maybe it doesn't help everybody that back in COVID, you know, people that had 20, 30 years worth of career, they're throwing them out just because they didn't want to get a, a vaccination. That was experimental. Who's the think, right? Obviously, I have my opinions on that. But uh, I, I think healthcare workers in general, now that we know that we're just expendable, that uh, it, it clearly is going to wear on your mental and health I don't know. What do you guys think? And I don't, I don't care for your opinions on vaccinations either, because that doesn't even The fact of the matter is, is that we're dispendable. Everybody's a number. And uh, it's, it's now common practice that they're just going to burn people out, burn them as long as they can until they disappear. And then somebody else will come in and replace them. That's, that's what we've seen. Number six, complexity of preventing diagnostic errors. Ooh. Now, this one seems like it's a complex question to answer. So complexity of preventing diagnostic error. Nowadays, the, the, the situation, it's, it's raining like really crazy. So if you guys hear some static, that's rain. The tempo in modern day healthcare has increased dramatically. Everybody's just a number. Get them in, get them out. How many knee surgeries have you done? Not like how well is the patient doing? How many knee surgeries have you done? And these guys are like cranking them out as fast as they can. That is patient care in the United States in general. So uh, is there going to be complexity with that? Yeah, because things are either going to get buried, um, staff hide things. I mean, I've, I've seen all the above. Um, the thing is, is uh, it gets into a finger pointing match. Like, no, you should have done this. No, you should have done this. And everybody blames the equipment, right? Is there uh, complexity of preventing diagnostic error? Yes. Um, here's the thing is if you fail to ever identify the problem, you have to identify the problem before you can come up with a solution. What it is, is they, they don't want to point fingers at anything or anybody specifically. And because of that, what they're doing is they're just creating solutions without identifying the problem. So we'll never get this solved. And as healthcare in, increases its tempo and we continue moving faster, it's going to always exist. We have to stop and we have to be more uh, evaluative of how we're doing processes and then come up with solutions whenever we identify a problem. You have to identify the problem. So, number seven, providing equitable care for people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Now, this is a complex one. Now, I myself, my family, uh, I, I have not been around too many people with uh, intellectual and physical disabilities. Um, many of you guys probably have, and you probably experience this day in and day out, to which I would love to hear what you guys think down below. Now, I do believe that healthcare in modern day America is much more suited to handle a lot of these situations. It used to be that they would just drug patients and chain them down, but now we've, we've actually gotten better at what we do, I believe. Now, maybe in some hospitals they're not trained properly and maybe the state needs to step in. That could exist, and I would, I would love to hear from you guys if that's the case. Obviously, I'm in Houston. Before that, South Carolina, I've worked in you know, world-class healthcare systems. So I've, I've kind of been immune from seeing a lot of that, but um, I, I'm, this one really maybe is a little concerning because I'd, I'd like to hear more about what, what people think is the real problem, but physical and intellectual disabilities. Now, like I said, I do believe that we're better equipped now than we've ever been before, but there's still obviously room for improvement. So let me down, be down below what you guys think, all right? Number eight, delay in care resulting from drug supply and equipment shortages. <laughs> we knew that. 
that's why I've been a huge advocate for right to repair for years. For years, because manufacturers nowadays create a consumable line that is only for one model. Now, there's no reason for this other than the fact that they can control planned obsolescence. See, the thing is, is this model infusion pump has this type of infusion set. Now they, they invent some new infusion pump, and miraculously, it takes a whole different set. I don't know why. If you've got a set that worked perfectly good for the last 15, 20 years, why would you need a new set for this pump? doesn't really make sense so it is common practice that manufacturers will design into a device planned obsolescence so when they stop creating the consumable the battery or whatever that's when that device is no longer relevant according to the manufacturer regardless of whether or not it's still useful so what does this mean well when they're talking about a delay in care resulting from drug supply and equipment shortages Consumables, supplies. If the manufacturer is the only one that can make certain supplies, then of course you're going to run into shortages. We are right now. We have this problem with all sorts of manufacturers. And luckily, some companies like RPI and whatnot are stepping up. And, and many of these medical technology companies out there, they're designing their own products to kind of fill in for it. And good for them. Because if there's one thing that we found out during COVID, it's that a bigger buffer is better when it comes to preventing the healthcare system from collapsing. Now, we've seen in just the last year that there's been several end of lives uh, on medical equipment that were rather unexpected. And because of that, healthcare systems are going to have to spend millions and millions of dollars trying to repair the damages that have been done by some of these OEMs. I'm a huge advocate for OEM uh, support in right to repair. There's some OEMs that do, and, and I congratulate them, and I will support their products any day, but there's some OEMs that are as anti-right to repair as possible. It just is what it is, and all they're doing is they're contributing to that delay. All right, so you got my opinion on it. Number nine, misuse of parental syringes to administer oral liquid medications. Well... I mean, the only other solution really would be to have a wider variety of syringes that are pre-mixed, but we know that that's not really going to happen, right? You can't have 10,000 syringes. They're going to have expiration dates, and it's going to be an absolute logistical nightmare. So this one here is obviously a staff issue. Obviously, they've tried solving some of this with barcodes and whatnot, but the fact of the matter is user error. Staff training is the only way that they're going to solve that Um Oral liquid medications administered via syringe. All it takes is one misinterpretation of patient weight or something like that. And now that's, you know, it's completely negligent. Um, it is what it is, guys. That one there, I don't believe. Number 10, ongoing challenges with preventing patient falls. Now, this is kind of an interesting one because um, you are never going to stop geriatric patients because that's who they're generally referring to. They, they get stubborn, they, they just get impatient, and they want to do things on their own. I understand. Right now, guys, trust me, I have a foot that's in a cast. I, I do understand, okay? Here's the thing, is we are coming up with newer technology that is going to be predictive, and predictive medicine is going to be the future. Many of these problems are solved through predictive medicine. Now, I've seen hospital beds that predict over the layout of a patient with load sensors, it predicts when a patient is shifting their weight because they are attempting to get up. Current technology, bed exit alarms, they wait for the scale to be offloaded dramatically, which means the patient's already starting to lift their weight up. Whereas predictive medicine, they can tell what load cells when you are just releasing ounces. If you release ounces off your upper torso and they go towards your lower torso, that is a patient attempting to get up. They are still safely in bed. That gives you precious moments to sit there and, and try and get in there and, and stop them from falling down. It's just one of those things, guys. I believe predictive medicine is going to help alleviate number 10, ongoing challenges with patient falls. What can you do? The other things are going to be staff processes. You know, they got the yellow socks and whatnot that identify patients that are their fall risk. Those are all good things. However, they don't eliminate the problem, and uh, that's why I said predictive medicine is probably the only thing that's going to help this going forward. 
It just is what it is. That's human nature in a nutshell. So anyway, guys, that's the top 10 list. According to the Easter Eye for 2024. Now, guys, I, I'd love to hear what you think about any of these down below. Please uh, leave a comment and maybe I'll do a subsequent video and maybe I'll reach out to somebody that's in the healthcare industry who's already a subject matter expert on any one of these points. We'll bring them on, maybe get their opinion and, you know, maybe we'll take some of you guys' input and help the industry. Who knows? Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Thought it was interesting. Easter Eyes top 10 list of patient safety hazards. Huh. Interesting. All right. Thanks for watching, guys.